Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Tonight I have a special interview for you with Oxford scholar and Giza Death Star book series author, Dr. Joseph Farrell. Now Dr. Farrell has found a secret system of finance behind the latest push for UFO threat disclosure from Congress, the CIA, and Homeland Security. Tonight he'll go even deeper and take us through the secret history and why the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination is so crucial to events unfolding now. Please join us now. <laughs> Joseph, it's great to have you back. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> We're having some very interesting pre-interview conversations. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to open up with something which we've tracked for a while in the background, and it is the emergence of this whole UFO Inc. thing through Congress. <laughs> now we have a whistleblower, this guy, uh, David Grush, and uh, <laughs> he was groomed by the likes of Knapp and Lou Elizondo and all those people. And here I am with my medals. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know the one. Uh, the photo The photo op was ready before his statement. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this guy is interesting because um, he, he did a lot of that intel talk, and when he came out and his stuff was blasted all around saying, oh, you know, the top intelligence official is saying that UFOs and crash retrievals and alien pilots and all this stuff. So we took the kind of op up a notch. And um, in any case, this UFO Defense Office arrow was promoting this idea of getting him uh, into these hearings. So finally, we've got these hearings going on, and it's Representative Tim Burchett from Tennessee. And uh, this guy has been on a roll trying to get a lot of attention going for this. He might be a naive congressman is just there to, to pump it up or there's something deeper going on with it. Uh, and his co-host is this, uh, Anna Paluna Luna. <laughs> and, uh, she's very interesting and her background is interesting. We'll get into that later, but there's some weird aerospace stuff and, and some weird threats and things that went on in the past with her. Mm -hmm. um, against her. Now, it's interesting. These things are taking place July 26th. This is coming right up um, here. And what they're trying to do, it looks like, through this process, is create a secondary corridor for bringing forward this version of the UFO file, as it were. And somehow there's a split going on. There's two tracks going on between the defense contractors and the front there, the Rubio Gillibrand mm -hmm. uh, piece. And some people are starting to point out that Silicon Valley uh, is involved in this as well, <laughs> which sets up a, a, quite a dynamic. Um, but recently, Chuck Schumer got into it, Joseph. And what he did uh, was he invoked the JFK Records Act and said, we need UFO transparency like we got with the JFK Records Act. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Biden just announced, of course, two weeks ago that no more JFK records release. That's it. You know, no more, no more. We're not, you know, the law went down in 1992 and said we needed to release it, but you know, that's it. You're not getting the rest. Yeah. Um, so all of the CIA files dealing with aerospace, dealing with the garrison, uh, testimony and trial, all of that piece, we never get to see under the current circumstances instantly Trump, RFK Jr. was saying, we'll release those records first day in office. Um, what's going on here, Joseph? Because it's like a strange hall of mirrors with a lot of momentum coming right into this very unusual summer. Well, I look, when when Trump was in office, he, he made a similar promise with the JFK records. And then when it came to the point of, of releasing them, as I recall, he said something to the effect of, you don't want to know what's in in them because it's it's too dangerous. Exactly. So, uh, so I, you know, anything that Trump says now, I, I'm I'm taking with a bag, five pound bag of salt. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's clear that the government has something to cover up. You mentioned Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So the way it looks to me, Daniel, is if you go back to the old report from Iron Mountain, which I'm sure oh, yes. you're familiar with. Yes. There are the final two things that they talk about as narratives that they can promote to put into place a global government, a global system of control, basically, is what they're talking about. Right. Uh, is environment and weather and a threat from outer space. Those are the two things. And it looks to me the way, if you follow the news cycle overall, they are pushing two narratives right now in this country over and over again. One is the UFO thing, that we have all of these whistleblowers low, and behold, they finally crawled out of the woodwork. They got a conscience, and here we are. UFOs are real. Aliens are here. They're visiting us, and we're under threat. <laughs> <laughs> the CIA wants to save us, Joseph. This and the great. CIA wants to save us. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, you know, boy, oh, boy. And then... On the other hand, we have all of this climate hysteria. It's hot as Hades out there right now, folks. Right. It's climate change like it never gets hot in July. <laughs> and, Phoenix is breaking records, Joseph. And Phoenix you know? is breaking records. That's never happened before. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, and this is the hottest it's ever been on record. Well, the problem is the records don't go back that far. For You're one right. thing, you know. You're right. Uh, we have no idea how hot it was a hundred thousand years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Knows, you know, so this is the problem. So they're driving, as far as I'm concerned, they're driving these two things. Um, what what intrigues me here is they're doing all of this at the same time that they are trying to roll out a clearly a new financial system. So, in other words. To put yourself into the way these people think, they are going to try and use one or both of these narratives in conjunction with their new financial system. Uh -huh. And that's what bothers me, because the financial system that they want to put into place is one of total control. It's mm -hmm. the kind of financial system that you put into place during wartime. Right. Everybody's on rations. Uh, you can't have a too big of a carbon footprint unless, of course, you're John Kerry and you want to borrow your wife's private jet. <laughs> right. you know, it, it helps when you have a ketchup fortune. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, the, this is the problem I'm seeing here. All of this is interconnected. So, in other words, we cannot look personally. I don't think you can look at the climate change operation and the Central bank digital currency, great reset operation, and the the UFO disclosure operation as separate things. These are connected in the minds of these globalists. So we have to start connecting them and thinking in terms, I, I'm going to just be blunt, we have to start thinking out of the box and we have to start thinking in terms of wacky scenarios. You know, I call it high octane speculation. That's right. what we've got to start thinking. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's very interesting, though, because that failure of the Silicon Valley Bank could have been yes. a warning, like from the defense contractors, hey, stay out of our UFO threat rollout, whoever yeah. you are. <laughs> yeah, whoever you are, stay out of it. And, you know, looking at Silicon Valley Bank, there were two major shareholders, J.P. Morgan and I forget who the other was. So in other words, if you if you want an opera and Catherine Fitz put it this way, and I think she's correct, if you want an operation that looked like a Federal Reserve takedown of a bank, that was it. Well, the question is why? Mm. Well, Silicon Valley Bank, if you dig into it, it was it was kind of the bank to to Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and startups. Right. You know, it, it would have been the bank to Elizabeth Holmes had it been around in, in the Theranos days with with Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of that's the kind of project wow. that they that they push. Um. So, looking at Silicon Valley Bank, there's something else that you know we were talking before the recording started that was happening in conjunction or at the same time as Silicon Bank, and I think it's related. Mm -hmm. When the bank started to fail, what you saw was all the whales were drawing their money out, all the big depositors. They were right. getting out of that thing as fast as they could. 
<laughs> but the other thing that was happening was in the banking system at large, small depositors were taking their money out of big banks and putting them into regional banks and, and uh, credit unions, which oh, yeah. there was no, you know, what's going on here. Interesting. Uh, I think I think people are wising up that that uh, these these central banksters want to eliminate cash. In other words, that's a way of stealing your money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's all this is because they are in trouble. And of course, what do, what do banksters do when they put themselves in trouble? They steal everybody else's money right. under under cover of some made up law or system or reg. You know, it, it's all BS. They want the cashless society. They want the cashless society. Well, they want the cashless society for everybody else but themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I asked you this question. Put yourself in the position of Don Corleone. Mm -hmm. And you are a an international drug lord, crime boss. Uh, you know, you're involved in all sorts of stuff. Are you going to trust your cash flow your cold hard cash to a banker that can turn it off via a digital currency? No way. No, no way. way. Yeah. No way. Uh, you either, if you're, if you're Mr. Central Bankster, you either have to crawl into bed and give these crime bosses absolute guarantees with their digital system. And if you're a crime boss, you're going to look at these people and say, there's no way I'm doing business on that level with these people, wow. not with their, not with their track record. Yeah. So exactly. In other words, Mr. Central Bankster wants to move all of us, all the honest people into their cashless system, but rest assured the hidden system of finance that I've been writing about for years is going to remain a cash based analog system of physical money exchange. Bottom line. That's where the real financial system. Is. That's where the real financial system is. And it's going to continue to rely on Paper notes, bearer bonds, you know, gold and silver and platinum and all that good tangible money. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not going to be relying on little blips on a computer screen. I, I guarantee you that. Not, <laughs> you know, this is interesting, and I'm going to see if this is related. You can let me know. They have new legislation being attached to the National Defense Authorization Act, and it has to do with the continuity of government program, which, you know, I, I keep <laughs> a close eye on. Uh, the COG program is interesting because they want to put in these new rules now about developing a new communications system, <laughs> uh, which sounds to me a lot like the original ARPANET. Yeah. Um, but that whole doomsday network communication we know was always outside of NSA or anybody else. Uh, and I can show you the, the sweeping legislation that they have for this amendment, which would go into effect for next year's NDAA. And when I think about you talking about the CBDC rollout, it That's sounds it. like there's some connection there. Oh, absolutely. They, they need a network for precisely the digital currency, and they need a secure one. Here's the problem. There's no such thing as any cyber security. None. No cyber, no cyber system is secure. You know, for let's go back and and I think you're absolutely right. This 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 new internet or ARPANET is is solely for the purpose of their their new central bank digital currency and whatever else they want to attach to it. Mm -hmm. You know, a social a social engineering uh, punishments, reward schemes, such as exists in communist China. Right. Uh, and let's remember, folks, a, a, a cryptocurrency is not a currency. It's a corporate coupon. They can turn it on or off. And here's what I think is, is ultimately coming. I think they're going to put into place a use it or lose it system. In other words, you've got a certain amount of time to spend your, your blips on the computer screen after that, the blips are no longer there. This is the way they are going to prevent anyone from accumulating wealth intergenerationally. Uh -huh. They want the game entirely for themselves. Wow, okay. that's incredible. Oh, yeah. This is exactly <laughs> what they intend. Um, 
the problem is, as I say, they're not going to be able to convince Don Corleone mm -hmm. to give up his cold, hard cash. Mm -hmm. Now, a digital system will work nicely if you are involved in tracking inventory secretly. Uh huh. It will work just fine. Think of Inslaw. Right. Okay. Think of that whole program being designed to track people through different systems using different computer languages and being able to compile a database regardless of what computer language a particular system was using. That's why that software was seized upon so quickly. Right. All right. It's perfectly tailor-made, in other words, for Mr. Don Corleone. Mm -hmm. What's not tailor-made for Mr. Don Corleone is that that system will not give him the tangible physical control over his money that he wants. In other words, he's never going to trust Mr. Central Bankster, and Mr. Central Bankster is never going to trust him. Right. Yeah. You know, this is the problem. These people are... <laughs> <laughs> they're putting they're putting into place this Rube Goldberg system that simply isn't going to work. No wow. one is ultimately going to trust it. And even if they succeed in 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 culling all the cash, which you know this is already proven to be a disaster in Nigeria where they tried it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. Exactly. It's not working too well. Uh, you <laughs> know, people are going to come up with a physical medium of exchange. That's all there is to it. That's money. That's right. money. Well, we've had a lot of the uh, kind of Bitcoin fantasy piece, too. You know, Bitcoin has its own thing, and it became the version of the digital currency right. um, prior to this whole talk of CBDC. I'm sure the feds watched this whole thing roll out. Oh, sure. But the problem, again, there is it doesn't represent anything. So it, it's, a, it's kind of a false paradigm. Yes. And it, it almost has created a cult thing. And I know a lot of people are very into it. But it does not satisfy the question at all. Well, here's here's the problem. It you don't even get the nice natural uh, uh, Federal Reserve note, right? You know, even even though the Federal Reserve note is nothing, you at least get a nice piece of paper for it, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, with with a central bank digital currency, you don't even get that. You've got yeah. something on a computer screen screen that's part of a distributed ledger called blockchain and it's all part of your wallet you right. know, all of this nonsense and here's the problem daniel you can go back as you know to the initial rollout of cryptocurrencies and what were they touting these they said are absolutely secure there's no way they can be hacked Right. And central banks don't have a damn thing to do with it. And this gives us monetary freedom and everything is going to be paradise at last. We're, <laughs> we're free from the central banksters. Well, you know, at the time I thought this is nuts. There is no cyber system that is secure. I don't care what fancy tricks you pull in your, in your blockchain distributed ledgers. There's no such thing. And sure enough, about five years later, the first story started to appear of this or that cryptocurrency being hacked. Yes. You know, so folks, you think it's going to be better if you turn all of this over to organizations like the Federal Reserve or the Bank of International Settlements or the Bank of England? <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> no. You could be walking into the biggest CBDC trap. Yes. And the trap was laid by the digital currencies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. What what do these things represent? And and I'm going to Daniel, I'm going to get on my soapbox one more time. <laughs> because right now we've got not only certain states in the United States talking about gold-backed cryptocurrency, okay? Oh wow. Oh yeah. You know, Texas is leading the way. Oh, well, we need a gold-backed digital system. That will protect everybody. Uh, and right now, you know, we've got the, the BRICS Summit upcoming in, in August in South Africa. And the Russians are talking about one of the things on the agenda is a gold-backed currency system for the BRICS nations. Now, what is the one thing they're not talking about? All of them, the states, the Russians, the BRICS, what are they not talking about? There's one thing that they're not talking about. What are they leaving out? 
a little thing I like to call convertibility. Right. Okay. When I was a kid, I, I and I've blogged this, Daniel, and I've I've put pictures up on the blog so that people can see these. I'm old enough to remember spending silver certificates. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. The Kennedy certificates. The Kennedy silver certificates. And on the silver certificate, it would say something to the effect, this note is legal tender and payable to the bearer on demand. One dollar right. in silver. Incredible. In other words, this was not a debt instrument, folks. It was not a note. It was a certificate. Please note, a Federal Reserve note is a note. Mm -hmm. A silver certificate is a certificate of deposit. Right. Okay? You could take that silver certificate to your local bank and trade it for a silver dollar. Mm -hmm. That's the point. That's convertibility. The one thing that they are not talking about is how are you going to exercise convertibility in that system? Do I have to go to Austin to redeem my computer blips for a piece of gold? Right. Or can I simply be issued a certificate and take it to the grocery store and spend that mm -hmm. at the grocery store or take it to my bank and get the actual bullion redeemed? Convertibility, in other words, makes it money. Mm-hmm. Everything else is just smoke up your new, you know what. Right. If they're talking, oh yeah, we're we're backing it with gold. No, don't be fooled. If it's if you cannot get that gold or silver or whatever it is they're backing it with, they're 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 blowing you know what up your you know what. Right. <laughs> I, yes. They're I, just I, using want with it. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they're using the idea. Yes. And communicating the idea with no substance. With no substance. Now, it's interesting to me because the central bank digital currency is the instrument for totalitarian control. Sure, of course. That's, that's the ultimate thing. And when you have a country in America that fought for freedom to throw just this kind of thing off yes. and is trying to keep that whole you know, uh, totalitarian system out of the government, Yes. As as a rule, um, you know, the idea of embracing the central bank digital currency is insane. It's yeah, it's not only insane; it's Alexander Hamilton on steroids. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm 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 pushing people to go back and look at the whole Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia and what actually happened there, mm -hmm. and why the Anti Federalists were so against it. It was all about money. Right. This BS that we've been fed in in this country in our school system was well. We needed a stronger system of government because we could weren't able to defend ourselves under the Articles of Confederacy. What the hell are you talking about? We defeated Great Britain under the Articles of the mm. Confederacy. Yeah, right, right. You know what? What was this other piece of paper needed for? Mm -hmm. Well, it was needed if you want to monetize the debt and create a central bank. Interesting. Which is exactly what Alexander Hamilton did. Yeah. The moment the ink was dry on the ratification, bang, off we go. Got to monetize all that debt. And by the way, who buys most of that stock in that first central bank? Great Britain. Barings Bank. Oh. Great Britain. Yes. They're the ones that underwrote the bonds for the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> Thank you, King George. <laughs> oh man, they got right back in the game. They got right back in the game. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> you know? It's interesting to think about this, uh, the whole financial instrument aspect, because yes. you've done a lot of investigation around secret systems of finance oh, yeah. and how these kind of shadow bonds have shown up oh. unusually in different hot uh, beds of, you know, situations that were leading to war, tensions, geo geopolitical disasters. The situation that comes up in relation to Taiwan oh. over and over again and China <laughs> advancing on Taiwan is interesting because you yeah. uh, pointed out a long time ago something about these Morgenthau bonds that go all the way back to 1934. 34. Yeah. Okay. For those who don't know the story, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader of China, uh, 
in, interesting dude. If you ever want to read about an interesting oh, yeah. dude, it's Chiang Kai Shek. <laughs> but um, Chiang Kai Shek during during the early period of the Japanese invasion of China wanted to get the nationalist Chinese gold out of China so that the Japanese would have no opportunity to recover it. Mm -hmm. So what he did was he arranged, he negotiated a deal and please listen very carefully to me now, folks. He negotiated a deal whereby the American federal reserve took Chinese gold and in return for that, gave the Nationalist Chinese government bearer bonds that were backed by that gold. In other words, the bearer bond became a certificate of deposit for the gold that China was sending to the United States for safekeeping. That's what happened. Right. Now, if you, if you follow the story, what the Federal Reserve did, now please note, it's the Federal Reserve, not the U.S. Treasury. What the Federal Reserve did was it issued these bonds to the Nationalist Chinese government over the signature of Roosevelt's Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, the mm -hmm. same guy that came up with the Morgenthau plan for Germany. That's the same guy. <laughs> okay. Issued these bearer bonds, and the bearer bonds that they issued were issued by the Federal Reserve. Please note this. These are not U.S. Treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. Can the Federal Reserve do this? Well, yes, it's a privately held stock corporation, and it can issue bonds just like any other corporation. Mm -hmm. But the Federal Reserve, when it did this, again, this is the story, issued these bonds with little deliberate mistakes in the bonds, misspellings, uh -huh. and so on. And it even issued the bonds under the name of Federal Reserved Bonds to make it sound nice. So what they gave Chiang Kai-shek were a bunch of bonds that had errors so that they, in turn, when when the nationalist government attempted to redeem the bonds and get its gold back, the Federal Reserve could say, oh, those aren't ours. Those are obvious counterfeits. Oh, <laughs> wow. There's we, just, we just ripped you off of a lot of gold. <laughs> wow. Now, here's the problem. It gets even better. Many of the bonds that, that the Chinese government got, the, the nationalist Chinese turned around and issued their own bonds under the nationalist Chinese government against those bonds in the Federal Reserve. Follow me? Yeah. So there are legitimate bonds of the nationalist Chinese government from the 1930s out there that were bought by people, Chinese and other people that invested in them. And these bonds are still out there. And the problem is that they have long since matured and come due for payment. Yes. Now, who would be there to pay them? Well, the communist government of China, the mainland government that took over China and kicked the nationalists to Taiwan, mm -hmm. the communist government says that those bonds were issued by a different government. They're not ours. We're not paying. Mm. The nationalist government, like it or not, still exists on Taiwan. Right. Uh, you can go to Taipei and see statues of Chiang Kai-shek, their mm -hmm. hero, you know. <laughs> um, for that matter, you can go to mainland China and still find people <laughs> that like Chiang Kai-shek. Right. <laughs> so, you know, no big deal there. But, but my point is, is that the Taipei government is the legal successor of the government that issued those bonds. Interesting. So during Trump's first administration, there were actually people that held those bonds that were asking him to negotiate the redemption of those bonds with Taiwan. Unbelievable. And folks, that's a heck of a lot of money. In today's <laughs> yeah, year. I know. How much money are we talking about? This is huge. No one knows. This is the problem. Wow. Now, if I if if you're following the the story with Chiang Kai-shek's gold, it would be about a hundred 
my guess would be between 100 and 150 billion dollars mm-hmm. which in today's money is you know with interest and everything else it's going to be off the charts okay. yeah oh yeah so how do you walk away from all of that one china right you allow taiwan and the mainland to reunite and taiwan says whoops defunct government sorry <laughs> not <laughs> one our, china policy one china policy not our problem beijing wow. says we can't pay so we're not gonna <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. That's an incredible solution. Oh, there yeah. is something there's something strange about this situation with China and Taiwan, and also the fact that there's all these war noises about it right now. Uh-huh. And um, we know that we're in an incredibly weak position because of the Russia-Ukraine war, <laughs> and that we're backing that whole nonsense and putting ourselves in the brink of nuclear disaster for this, you know, uh neocon mission. But it's putting us in a weaker position in relation to this very strange uh, Taiwan situation. Yes. And China's looking at that, and they're thinking this is a way to consolidate it all. They've made every president sign on to this one China policy, right. even if while they're, you know, we still have these relations with Taiwan. Right. Yeah, they have. And, you know, the, the problem the United States has with Taiwan is that many Taiwanese themselves want to to rejoin the mainland and what most most americans don't know it pardon me is that that we have this impression of communist china as monolithic authoritarian yes totalitarian yes monolithic no because you know there are many mainland families that that have family on taiwan so in other words from from a purely uh cultural social sense it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the Taiwanese are not opposed to rejoining the mainland. And there are many people in the mainland that, as I mentioned, are, are, are not hostile to Chiang Kai-shek nor the nationalist Chinese. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, it's a, it's, in other words, it's a nuanced situation. It's not a black and white situation. Mainland bad, Taiwan good. It's not that at all. Um, so there's that problem. The other problem is neither the Taiwanese nor mainland China wants a war. Right. You know, what they want to do is they want to make money. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) It's very simple. And, And the last way to do that is to have a war between communist China and the United States. Um, Oh yeah, absolutely. No one benefits with that. Uh, whenever it's funny, whenever you dive into the secret system of finance, it always lands in the middle of all of these hotbed yes. situations yes. politically and uh, at home. And you've done a lot. You did so much work around the uh, things like the Cavaver committees, the McCarthy hearings, and all the yes. things that happened in the 1950s 50, that were trying yeah. to track some influence inside of the government. Right. And I can't help but think that that secret system of finance is the oh, thing, absolutely. ultimately, they're trying to ferret out. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think the committee era is not simply a, a struggle between two deep states, because you had, you had the progressive deep state that, that uh, literally put communists into the government. You know, and on right. that score, McCarthy was right. But you also had the the post war paperclip operation with bringing in a bunch of Nazis. So what do you find when you dig and scratch long enough with Senator McCarthy? Well, you find all of these strange roundabout Nazi connections behind him. Mm-hmm. So you've got these two contesting deep states going on in the committee era. The one committee that I think is the crucial one to study from that era is the Reese Committee on Foundations. Interesting. Uh, Because the foundations were at the time under a lot of scrutiny for how they were promoting, you know, an unending progressivist ideology in American education. So this would be like the Ford Foundation, the, the Rockefeller Foundation, Foundation, Foundation. Rockefeller, yeah. Carnegie, Endowment for Peace, and all of this stuff. Uh, these these were were the big money uh, aspects of, of what McCarthy, Kefauver, and others were looking at in terms of the politics of it. So 
if you look at the at the at the money aspect of this if you look at the foundations you find something very interesting and this was actually brought out by the chief counsel of the Reese committee a fellow by the name of Rene Wormser he wrote a book on it um he pointed out that what the foundations really resembled the most were the medieval military orders like the Hospitalators, or the Knights Templar, or the Teutonic Knights. Interesting. Why? Because they were mechanisms of accumulating intergenerational wealth in private hands in a jurisdictional setup that kept them entirely out of the secular taxing authority and even the ecclesiastical taxing authority. Ah, and totally all, independent. Totally independent. And all you needed to add to the modern foundation, get this, and these are his words, was the addition in the case of these medieval entities, a private military. Oh, right. Well, what do you have now? Yes. BlackRock. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. You're creating private jurisdiction. Okay, with private jurisdiction comes the necessity of tracking the wealth and mm -hmm. managing that wealth. So you've got to have a system of accounting. There's your, ARP, your new ARPANET. But you also have to have a physical medium of exchange, and that's what they are going to keep to themselves, in my opinion. Oh, they, wow. cannot, they cannot have a functioning system without it. So they'll Don't operate. Don't Corleone is not going to allow it. <laughs> right. They'll operate on that higher level with sure. actual tangible yes. uh, goods to yes. exchange with, and they'll have yes. the plebes, as it were, uh, being in this central bank digital currency, which doesn't actually hold any real wealth. It holds the reflection of wealth yes. as they allow it yeah. uh, for those who are favorable to their political positions. Right. Incredible. That's it's, such it's a it's entirely a, medieval. Yeah. It's well, medi they, it's medieval with computers. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's take this leap and see if we can take this leap. I'll leave it to you. We have with the UFO hearings mm -hmm. now Chuck Schumer coming forward and saying, I demand UFO disclosure, and we're gonna do it based on how the JFK Records Act was done in nineteen. Oh, and that's worked out so well too. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. We're still waiting for those. Actually, we're still Biden just for said, that disclosure here. <laughs> <laughs> Biden just said, "Well, we're not going to give you any more records. Forget it." Yeah, I know. Um, but this is interesting because here we go again. Hearings now. Schumer, who we know is as dirty as Harry Reid, and he said, "I'm going to take Harry <laughs> Reid. I'm going to walk in his footsteps." Uh, the late Harry Reid, there of Nevada, Area 51 fame, uh -huh. um, and he now is leading the charge. Okay, now uh, we have, as I said, Burchett and Luna leading the charge about this committee hearing that they're going to do on UFOs. Now there's the announcement that Schumer might be doing his own, and Gillibrand and Rubio with Arrow, they want to do their own. Uh -huh. So we have all these hearings, and it's very reminiscent. It knocks me right back into the books with you talking about Kefauver and McCarthy and now these foundation hearings. Yeah, there... What I think you're looking at is the delayed schedule. You know, Hillary Clinton was, was supposed to be the UFO president. Right. And we we saw how that turned out. So what they're doing, as far as I'm concerned, is they're going back to their original schedule, which is, you know, it's been delayed a few years, and they're having Schumer trot all this out. And in the process, what they're doing, again, I think is narrative preparation. Mm -hmm. They are prepping the narrative for an ET disclosure, which they can control. Right. This is why they spent, you know, when, when we did the two secret space program conferences, there were people there. Uh, I, I am utterly convinced. And, and they determined that they had to shut those down because they were going to lose control of the narrative. Right. No question. Uh, yeah. Now, they will never get complete control of the narrative, but they have exercised enough control of it 
and are capable, as you know, of ginning up the marketing that they need to literally drown out any questioning or opposing voice or other interpretation or narrative to what they want to put out. That's what's going on. These hearings, in other words, these hearings, I think, are of an entirely different character than that of McCarthy or Kefauver or or Reese. Because whatever you say about Senator Kefauver or McCarthy or Congressman Reese, none of those men were insincere in what they were doing. Mm-hmm. They were trying to to get to a truth that they sensed was there and and they may have been good or bad about it or more or less successful with it, but they were at least sincere. These hearings to me, and I have not, I, I've probably seen a mere fraction of what you've seen, Daniel. I can, I can guarantee you because I, you know, I've lost all interest in what's going on in the swamp. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's just more swamp stuff, you know, but, yeah. um, as far it's a as, lot of spaghetti on the wall. I it's a lot of spaghetti. You know, it's it's a lot of theater. And that's what I think these hearings are really about. They are about driving a narrative into the conscious of consciousness of the public that watches such things or hangs on every word that is aired on C SPAN. Uh, right. that that's what this is about. Uh, so in other words, I you know. Am I willing to believe that Chuck Schumer really needs it when he wants complete and total disclosure like the JFK archive? Well, yeah, he's telling you right there when he refers to the JFK archive that the last thing he wants is total right. and complete government disclosure of the UFO file. Because Exactly, yeah. You know, yeah, if, if Biden could say, no, we're not following the law, then, you know, wh- what good does it do to pass legislation about the UFO? The government's going to withhold what it wants to withhold. Exactly. And it's going to release what it wants to release. In other words, it's all about narrative control. And that's all this is, theater. It's amazing, too, because the people involved, um, you know, Gillibrand, I've pointed out on a few occasions, because she is a senator from New York mm-hmm. whose father-in-law was the head of British Aerospace for yep. many years, yep. and uh, whose husband was the lawyer for Nexium. And says so a lot of really sketchy things in her past. But what I find interesting about what she is doing, she placed something into the 2024 NDAA, and it went something like this. Any group anywhere who has access to this anomalous material from a UFO, (laughs) if you're a government contractor or anything, it has to all come back under our roof here within three months. And then if you don't, you get another delay, 180 days, and that's it. If not, you're looking at long-term prison and all the rest of it. So they want to put all of that material now back under one central roof because something is coming up that's like a trademark of the UFO. Yeah, I I suspect that that's one definite possibility for why they're doing it. The other is that such a law would allow them to claim, without any proof, of course, to claim that something is a UFO-related technology and therefore to to grab a a technology out from underneath a corporation or an inventor or what have you right so in other words this this to me is a um it's a patent grab is what it is right exactly um Wow. It, al- it also tells <laughs> it also tells yeah. me the narrative that the narrative prep aspect of it is central most now in their mind. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to something I wrote about, you know, and, and under that kind of law, they could say that anything that you say, in other words, anything that I've written in my books, they can say, oh, shut up, Farrell. This, right. belongs, this belongs to us because it's a national security issue. Exactly. Well, exactly. You know, I've got, I've got a finger for them. But anyway, um, <laughs> The, the problem here is, is it's more narrative prep. So I go back to what I wrote in, in my book, Saucers, Swastikas, and PSYOPs. Yes. Because you'll recall that in that book, I pointed out that Otto Skortseni, the Nazi commando that was the favorite commando of Hitler, 
made a reference in one of his memoirs that he had seen a technology that would allow the maximum psychological operation capability and could be deployed, in his words, behind enemy lines oh, wow. for psychological operation purposes. And in the context of, of other things that he writes and other people write, I came to the conclusion that the technology that he had seen may have been the bell. Right. And if, if it was, therefore, a, a UFO-related technology like that, then what he's really telling you is, oh, we have psychological operations plans for this stuff. Interesting. And, you know, bring over a bunch of Nazis with Operation Paperclip, and they're all thinking this way. Mm -hmm. And it, it stands to reason that, you know, if you put them in charge of a lot of black projects in the U.S. government, which we did, you know, mm -hmm. to our chagrin, we're going to get the same sort of twisted thinking about, well, how can we use this? You know, we can we can uh, maybe genetically engineer a couple bodies to plant around and get people to think we're being invaded by aliens and crash a lot of really neat looking Interesting. stuff. Interesting. You know, yeah. Yeah. This this could be the cosmic false flag. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Well, when you mention paperclip, there it's fascinating because the Germans their plan was to control things from space. Yes, so this is true. this is a holdover program. Yeah. 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 The problem is nobody nobody seems to be thinking in 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 CS Lewis terms, you know, that if you call down high heaven on your heads, don't be surprised if it shows up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So they're performing this UFO false flag and boom, yeah. well, you start Yeah, maybe the real thing shows up, you know. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how you control that narrative? <laughs> There's a Kennedy uh, lineage in there. Absolutely, <laughs> there is here. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> you have to wonder. You know, I, I really do wonder. Did did John did John Kennedy was all this kind of thinking going through his head? Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. and and the man was not stupid. So the chances are probably at some yeah. point, yeah, he was thinking along similar lines. Well, I mentioned to you that Gorbachev gave a speech at the Texas School Book Depository. Yes. And he said, you know, Kennedy was so far advanced in his thinking that we're just catching up to it now. Mm -hmm. But he's showing up at the Texas School Book Depository. Gorbachev? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say? I mean, you know, we know a lot about diplomacy and uh, politics and visuals. Like, Well, what, you what know, he... Gorbachev actually... Um friended me on facebook when he was still alive <laughs> wow it's incredible weirdest, it was the weirdest thing <laughs> did you get to communicate with him no I, you know I, I i saw the you know it may have been somebody running his facebook account probably oh, right, right 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 wow that was well, just thought that's weird <laughs> <laughs> well we know one of the most beautiful things that he did was when he was giving that talk in new york and uh george schultz was sitting next to him oh yes and he was talking to charlie rose and he he said you know reagan took me aside at reykjavik and said will you help us with this alien threat because you know if the ufos invade what are we going to do and he said he was totally absolutely serious sure. and everybody was freaked out henry kissinger was about to fall out of his chair <laughs> Uh, and he said, I'm sorry for bringing this up, you know, and then Charlie Rose started to laugh like crazy. And, but I think it's very significant. He put that out there oh, and yeah. put it across. Yeah. And this is kind of the legacy from the Kennedy aspect, mm -hmm. because when we have RFK Jr. running in 2024, and he's going very transparent on mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, but this, this you'll get a kick out of, and I wonder what you think of it. Edward Dowd you probably heard from this financial expert who has stepped out of all that to give everyone some kind of idea of what Wall Street is doing in the middle of all this and the COVID op and everything else. He's become the co-treasurer of the RFK Jr. campaign. And he came out recently, uh, yeah, <laughs> he came out recently and he said they're prepping an alien threat yes. in order to bail out their whole end game of the central banks. Oh, now, I can believe that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I can definitely believe that because let's go back to something I said um 
Well, in in the Covert Wars, Breakaway Civilization and Class of Civilization book, and I repeated it in the 2014 um, Secret Space Conference in San Mateo. Right. The, the Kennedy bearer bond that was at the heart of the original bearer bond controversy, which was that $134.5 billion seizure. By Unbelievable. Yeah. It's an incredible story. But yeah. It's totally incredible. On the back of the bearer bond, on the front of it, you see Kennedy's picture. On the back of this thing, you see three things. You see the moon. You see the space shuttle, and you see the lunar excursion module from Project Apollo. Billion-dollar bearer bond, supposedly. And even though the bonds are fake, there's a message there. Because the people putting out the fake bonds is a big securities trading firm in, in the Asia-Pacific region, you know, money world. Uh, so somebody's you know, expecting them to get paid off. So yeah, yeah. they're discovered so, as you noted. They're discovered in the hollow of the, the luggage and the hollow of an attaché case. Yes, incredible. By the yeah, by the Italian financial police. <laughs> now you know this means that Italian intelligence is very good, or someone has tipped them off. And who who? Why are these bonds being carried by two Japanese men? Who and for are that kind of money? For that kind of money, and they're supposedly fake, and then the men are released and disappear. Incredible. You know, the story makes no sense. On the face of it, it makes no sense. Do you think it represents an exchange inside of that secret system? Yes, I do, and here's why. We have been, and, and I want to return to my, my major point here about the bond itself and, and those three things on the yes. back. But we're going to take a little detour here or around, go around Harvey's barn, like my mom used to say. The, the bond itself, we have been assured in all of these bearer bond scandals are fake. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, here's the question that I have that no one has been adequately able to answer. If you're a counterfeiter, if you're a typical counterfeiter, and you go to the length and expense of counterfeiting money, do you counterfeit $7 bills? In other words, do you counterfeit things that don't exist? Right. Answer, no. Absolutely not. Second question, why would you counterfeit things in such astronomical amounts of value, even if they do really exist? Why would you bother to counterfeit such things? Because the people that you would be able to redeem them for you are probably not going to to do it. Why, Why go to all of this length expense to counterfeit either things that don't exist or that exist in such astronomical amounts of value that you are only going to get a fractional return for the effort and endanger your own life in the in the process. Why? It doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. That's so much None money. They it, must know that the genuine article exists. exists. Right. So here's the next problem. Let's go back to that Kennedy bearer bond from the original bearer bond scandal. The moon, the space shuttle, the lunar excursion module. When I saw that, I thought, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's why these things are real. What they're doing, Daniel, is they are playing the same game as the bankers on the Venetian Rialto during the Renaissance. They're floating loans. They're they're collateralizing them with bonds to merchants to go trade spices or slaves or whatever with China and so on. Right. And the bankers by doing so get a cut of the action in return. So they're collateralizing their loans with whatever is being traded in what they're financing. 
So right. they've extended this operation to outer space. They right. are collateralizing what they think is going to be out there and thereby creating enormous amounts of liquidity in the system. So let's look at another thing that indicates that space is absolutely at the heart of this. So they're, they're space bonds. Is what you're they saying. are space bonds. Incredible. Listen, listen carefully. During the 2008 financial meltdown, what's at the heart of it? Well, at the heart of it are all the derivatives. Mm -hmm. Toxic the assets. Toxic assets. All of this financial paper, tranches of securities of tranches of securities, rehypothecated over and over again to the point that the best estimates are that the amounts of derivatives in the system now are anywhere from 14 to 17 quadrillion dollars, right. which is several times the gross domestic product of this entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about wow. United States, China, Russia, Germany, France, the entire gross domestic product of the, the entire globe. planet. Wow. Huh. Now, how do you get rid of that on the books? You collateralize the assets you think are out in the space. So, lo and behold, after the financial meltdown, what do we start seeing in the news? We start seeing stories about, oh, they discovered an asteroid and it has all this mineral wealth and it's estimated to be worth about, oh, looky, $14 quadrillion. Oh, yeah. Now, that indicates to me they've collateralized space. Okay? Amazing. Number yeah. one. So the next problem is, okay, for us to wipe this off the books, we have to go out and get it. Right. We have to back the claim up. Now, you can do this, Daniel, one of two ways. You can actually go out there and get it, drag it to the moon or wherever, and mine it. Mm -hmm. And that's when we saw all these, I mean, they were comical. There were these articles coming out from NASA. I blogged about them of these satellites with what looks like a big cup. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> going out and you grab the asteroid <laughs> and, <laughs> and bring it back in your Dixie cup on, <laughs> exactly. your, on your chemical rockets and you mine don't, it. Don't worry about that gravity problem. Don't worry about <laughs> that gravity problem. <laughs> So you go out and mine the stuff. Or you claim to have done so. Ah. And here we're at our, our ET false flag up. Mm. Because if you can create a threat that is capable of interdicting you, mm -hmm. then you create a situation of war. And what do wars require? Well, wars require lots of financing and lots of bonds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that it's the old Confederate money scheme again. The Confederate States of America will pay to the bearer on demand within 10 years of a conclusion of a P treaty of peace between the United States of America and the Confederate States of America, oh. X amount of dollars on demand. Incredible. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's what they're and we doing. still don't know where they were going to get that. And they st <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So that's the scheme going on. They have literally, in my opinion, collateralized space because it allowed them to create liquidity in the system that otherwise could not and would not be there. But now they have to, you know, the financial crises have forced them to make good on it. So what do we do? Well, we have to go out there now. Oh, right. And here's another problem, you know, since we're since we're talking these wild and woolly scenarios. <laughs> here's a here's a little Charles Fort problem for you. <laughs> what if those assets out there already belong to somebody else? Uh. Or to put it in banksters' terms, what if someone else already has a lien on them? Yeah. And we all of a sudden show up with our Dixie cups and are going to mind actuary XYZ. Oh, no, you're not. That belongs to us. Prevention. Ring, maker, ring makers of Saturn here, folks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Somebody else apparently is already mining the rings of Saturn. So, so if we show up and suddenly start doing it, we might be claim jumpers, you know? <laughs> 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 that is fascinating. Uh, yeah. Well, let's think of this as collateralizing the moon, for example. Yeah. Uh, because th- what, what gets me about the bear bonds and why I still think they hang out there is a very strange mystery is that Kennedy is on the bear bond. Yes. And Kennedy uh, is the one who said, you know, we're going to go to the moon. Let's yes. Go to the moon. But this group, uh, who presumably is in charge of the secret system of finance, Kennedy would be such a hated enemy that you'd think they'd never put him on a, a bear bond. I think it's the reverse. I think it's the reverse. Uh-huh. Because what what is Kennedy up to? At the time that all of this is going down, before his assassination, with within six months of his assassination, he promulgates that executive order to create four billion dollars worth of United States notes. Right. And that bypasses the Federal Reserve completely. Now, again, I'm old enough to remember spending those Kennedy United States notes. Mm-hmm. So if you want to know what a United States note is, it's a note like a a dollar bill that instead of a green treasury seal like on a federal reserve note or a blue treasury seal like on a silver certificate or an orange one like on a gold certificate it had a red seal right which indicated that it was simply fiat money issued on the gross domestic product of the country itself that's what it meant right so in a technical sense, it was not a note. It was, a, it was another kind of certificate. But I remember spending those. Yeah. You know, there were a few that actually made it into circulation. And like silver certificates and gold certificates, these notes were taken out of circulation by the Federal Reserve whenever they came through their, their system of clearing. That's how they've controlled the money supply, folks. So strange. That is all still legal tender. But if you put it into the Federal Reserve System, you'll never see those those paper notes again. So do you think of the bonds as a kind of ode to our enemy kind of thing? What they are, Kennedy, what I think they are, is that Kennedy was also made the United States signatory to treaties, space treaties, Mm -hmm. for the United States, the Soviet Union, France, Germany, Britain, so on all signed on to the idea that the moon was nobody's property. In other words, the, the, um, the discovery law that had, that had been operative in, in Europe with respect to the new world was not going to be operative with respect to whoever got onto the moon first and planted their flag there. Mm-hmm. Planting the flag there did not mean you were staking a claim to sovereignty over the moon. Right. Okay. I suspect that it really means something else. Mm -hmm. Because national sovereignty is not in view here. Right. Corporate mineral rights are a different idea altogether. So they're putting Kennedy on there as an acknowledgement that he paved the way for what they want to do. Interesting. That is absolutely fascinating interpretation. Uh, If you were to look at the the idea that we have the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. Uh This year. And just before that, Biden removed any access to the records that would implicate you know, intelligence activity and the things that are left in those records, probably mm-hmm. some kind of RFK booby trap that was left in there in the first place, because oh, yeah. otherwise, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the, the fear that they have around those records doesn't make any sense no. Uh, no. under normal circumstances. And what's weird is we had the Napolitano story about the JFK records, which was his personal conversations with Trump when Trump said, Andrew, yes. trust me, you don't want to see what's in there. And like, you wouldn't believe it. 
And then now we have uh, Roger Stone a year later repeating yes. the same story, saying he got the same story from Trump on this. So there's some aspect here, and I put it together with the fact that Schumer was saying, we'll do this like the JFK Records Act. There's some crisscrossing in the messaging here around the UFO file and bringing it out. And uh, there's this weird conversation where they have John Stossel talking with Mike Pompeo. And he said, oh, listen, you know, we shouldn't let the rest of those JFK records out. When he was CIA director, Mm -hmm. he didn't do it. He was the one who blocked it. So this Mm -hmm. is a recent conversation that he has. And he says, by the way, I've seen the UFO file, too, right on top of it. Right. Right. Um, And so we have this indication then that something about releasing the JFK records is associated with this release around the UFO file. Uh Uh Whenever you get around this aspect of the assassination, what is not mentioned is something that you've brought up very well, which is the post-Nazi paperclip aspect around the assassination. Oh, huge. It's huge. Uh, Let me, let me flip your question a bit. Yes. uh, And, and approach this whole subject from a very different point of view. Mm Mm-hmm. Is it likely that the deep state would have in its presidential briefings that it had to do for President Trump, is it likely, in your opinion, that they would have included a full briefing to him on what was in the JFK files? Well, it's interesting because I think they would have tried to have shrouded it. Yes, precisely. Uh, no question. Yes. This yeah. is my point. Okay. Now, assuming that they shrouded it then, mm-hmm. where is Trump getting the information that he's sharing with Roger Stone or Judge Napolitano when he says, trust me, you don't want to know what's in them. It's too horrible. Right. Where is it? If it's not coming from the deep state, what's the conduit to Trump? of whatever that information may be. And I suspect it's coming from two places, both probably operative. Number one, Roy Cohn, the original swamp creature, as you like to call it. Oh, yes. If, if there's anybody that's going to know, it's him. Absolutely. And the other source is John Kennedy Jr. Right. Close friend of Donald Trump. Yes. So in other words, I think there is... Probably something that to this day the Kennedy family knows and suspects and has kept to itself. And I think this may be the the reason that their their danger alert media media uh, meter is in the purple zone mm-hmm. with RFK Jr. running. Right. Absolutely. Because he already knows something. Yes. And probably he knows exactly where to find the documentary group. Ah. That's my suspicion. That's fascinating. And Trump probably does too. Mm -hmm. They would not be going so apoplectic over both of these men trying to keep keep RFK as far away from the Democratic the yeah, oh, as yeah. far away from the Democratic primaries as they possibly can. <laughs> and for God's sake, don't let Tucker interview the guy again. <laughs> get him out of thrown off air in the yeah, first place. Get him out of Fox. You know? <laughs> and the other reason that they're acting so apoplectic with Trump, you know, keep this guy in court. Please don't ever let him get near the White right. House. They are acting panicked about something and they just I announced it, yeah, yeah they just announced a new indictment of trump for yeah, jay six now yeah it is it is like panic exactly yeah it, it, they are they are grabbing at every straw and spaghetti that they can throw against the wall and hope something sticks and the problem is i don't think anything is going to stick mm-hmm. i really don't sooner I, I mean daniel we're living through the collapse of the soviet union only we're living through the collapse of the american empire oh yeah you know, yeah. that's what that's what we're going through. You know, the Russians have been through it. Don't want to do it again. Thank you very much. Uh, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you know? exactly. uh, that's exactly what we're living through. But um, there's something about the assassination and the UFO file yes. 
which forms a kind of um, it's a, it's a knowledge line which yes. would destroy the deep state in this yes. country if it came out. This yes. is the nature of the problem, and yes. it has to do with both of those items. I think it has to do with both of those items. I'm in total agreement with you because I think I think the truth would be something along the lines that that number one, yeah, we crawled into bed with the Nazis after the war to gain access to a lot of technology. That's number one. Number two. We also have, in my opinion, probably some demonstrable extraterrestrial technology or connection, or perhaps subterrestrial or you know suboceanic. Who knows? But yes, but we're in contact with a something somewhere, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and thirdly, that contact may the UFO occupants. <laughs> yeah, the, whatever you want to call them, I call them the genetic cousins. Uh huh. Um, because the records, you know, the ancient records are very old, and and they talk about this sort of thing. So you know, put me in, put me in Eric von Deniken's camp, except I'm not quite as nutty. Um, <laughs> the. <laughs> Well, you know, von Deniken likes to start talking about theology, and whenever he does, I'm just like, oh, please, you know, <laughs> do a real little homework before you do this. <laughs> the real question is is how this guy is still around. It's kind of amazing. He put that book, original book out in 69 or something. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, you know, he, yeah, and he's still going strong, still <laughs> cranking him out there, guys. <laughs> But um, no, I, I definitely think that there's a, a continuum and there's some, like you, there's some thread or there's some, some connecting factor or set of facts between all of this that they don't want to get out there because, in my opinion, it ruins their power and it ruins the narrative that they've either decided to adopt or the other possibility is that they've been forced to adopt. Oh, Yes. Uh, I mean, if they're, if they're in contact with something, that contact may be saying, you're going to do it this way. And, you know, they've got no choice, which I think is entirely possible. You know, if you're called on high heaven, don't be surprised if it shows up. Right. And it may not be the good guys. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, it's, it could be highly likely, not only possible. Sure. Um, let's look at it this way. Kennedy is assassinated on the cusp of um, going whole uh, deep into a Russia U S going to the moon program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they're going to do the, the whole space race. They're going to call that off and they're going to mm -hmm. do joint moon missions and mm -hmm. Khrushchev and everything else. It's very interesting too. When they show the picture, there's a, a film of Khrushchev going to sign the condolence page and if you look at him signing the condolence page for Kennedy, he he looks like somebody who just got you know yeah. hit by a bulldozer. Yeah, and I think it's genuine, and yeah, I think that he too. knows you know. Yeah. Uh, when he's thinking of this, and of course he's out of power himself within you know a few months, basically. Yes. Um, but when we look at that scenario of Kennedy really getting into NASA and really manhandling the space program and figuring out these aspects, including the fact that they had two tracks yes, uh, and programs like blue Gemini and things like that. And then you have sitting in the middle of it, the paperclip Nazis like von Braun and Dornberger and Dornberger, as we know, <laughs> being directly connected into the assassination uh, through the fact of the pains, yes, the pains. Michael Payne and bell helicopter. Uh, and the fact that Oswald was staying there, which, just sits out there, you know, I mean, how can you not make that connection? It's very much like the Hinckley Bush connection when Kennedy, uh, when Reagan gets shot. Yeah. Um, but when you look at this aspect, there's, there's one piece hanging out there and it comes out of, uh, some of the Seymour Hirsch and Judith Exner books. Mm -hmm. And Judith Exner, uh, was someone that Frank Sinatra set up with John Kennedy and uh, she became his go-between for getting information and all the rest of it. And everyone always assumed, well, you know, he's doing mafia stuff back and forth or whatever. But if you actually read what she had to say about one time she opened the envelope that was going to these defense contractors from Kennedy, 
and coming back and the mafia was giving her these things that when she opened it up, there was a diagram there that looked like something like a rocket is what she thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she was looking at electronics. Mm -hmm. And when I think about Kennedy and his assassination, I still think it's a strange risk for the deep state, the way that they did it. And the fact that, you know, 60 years later, it makes everyone question that corner of the intelligence world um, because of their active cover up around it. But when you think of these pieces about him being involved in the exotic technology directly as president, that's the problem, in my opinion. Oh, listen, I let let's let's sweeten that pot a bit more. Yes. Um, There's no doubt in my mind that that first of all, he's he's prepping the joint mission with the Soviet Union by having that treaty about. Nobody has has claim on the moon. Sign. Yes. Okay. So, in other words, that whole narrative makes sense from from his foreign policy objectives and what he's doing with Soviet Russia. Uh, but the technology, the advanced technology aspect of this, in my opinion, has never been adequately connected to JFK nor to the assassination. But let's let's look at one example. It's not just Werner von Braun and uh, Dornberger that Kennedy would have his eye on. He would have definitely had his eye on Arturo Rudolph, mm-hmm. the man that actually designs and builds the Saturn V. Okay, it's Arturo Rudolph's brainchild. Incredible. So. Artur Rudolph, if you go back to that time period, the Nazis were the ones that were absolutely fed up with how the how NASA was dragging its feet. Mm-hmm. The Nazis wanted to design and build the Saturn V in-house by themselves, forget the American contractual process and all of this. You know, you, you can just imagine a bunch of, of Nazi scientists just losing their patience over how snails pays progress is yes you know they're in a hurry they want to get there (laughs) okay (laughs) but there's another figure that is is absolutely crucial to kennedy's thinking and exposure to big technology and that's hermann obert right the the nazi that that werner von braun absolutely insists that not nasa bring over to this country why and why is he so crucial? Because it's Herman Obert who gets here and does a couple of interviews, and people think, yeah, this guy's a Nazi, all right, because he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, Obert gets over here and he does a couple of interviews. And he's the American, one who talked about extraterrestrials, isn't he? Some American reporters ask him. Dr. Obert, where did you guys get all of this? You know, how did you come up with all of this wonderful technology? And his answer was, if he had help. Incredible. And, I mean, it's. <laughs> and he made no bone. Yeah, with ETs, you know. So Obert is another one Kennedy's going to have his eyes on. Mm-hmm. And if he's looking at Obert, here's one for you that I really think he's got his eye on. He's Navy. Philadelphia experiment. Oh yes. Morris Jessup, the case for the UFO. Right. The the Varro edition of the case for the UFO. Right. Why do I think that Kennedy has this? Because because as I pointed out in Saucer Swastikas and Psyops, a copy of the Varro edition is given, you can see the picture of the two Navy captains who were in charge of coming up with the Vero edition in the Pentagon with a bunch of other people, including Admiral Hillencotter. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) And they're all gathered around a table, and I put this picture in the book so that people would think, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Ding, ding, ding. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. They're all around a table, conference table, seated at the other side of the table by himself, like he's holding court, is Werner von Braun. Oh, right. So in other words, 
you can include Werner von Braun as one of the recipients of the Vero edition. That's what I'm telling you. Ah, yeah. And if he's getting it, you can rest assured that JFK is going to find out about all of Mm -hmm. this, and he's going to do some reading on his own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no two ways <laughs> about this, folks. <laughs> well, it's interesting because when you hear the thing about the diagrams coming back to him, you know, what's interesting is Hirsch and guys like that, they were trying to do, hey, it's Dark Side of Camelot and Mafia payoffs. And, you know, she writes in her own book, actually, you know, it was in those envelopes. It wasn't money, it was blueprints. And here's here's another question then. This indicates or implies that Kennedy has set up his own little private network of dead drops. Oh, right. Relying on the mafia as the conduit for the information that's being dead dropped. Now that, yeah. <laughs> now, okay. That's, that's very interesting because that, that's how he's got his own little, and yes, yeah. and that would explain a lot of why, why do we have so many mob connections with his assassination? Well, what that means to me is, okay, he set up his own little private intelligence network and mm-hmm. he's got a bunch of mob bosses doing it. Mm-hmm. He's got his brother, Bobby going after the mob publicly. So that may be the leverage he used to get them to go along with doing something ah. like this. You see, so it plays out any number of ways. And, oh, by the way, that network is ultimately turned against him. Right. Because we know the mob's uh, fingerprints are all over the assassination in Mm -hmm. some cases. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, again, the, the picture, you know, the more details that you add to the picture that assassination researchers have compiled, the, the basic picture makes more and more sense the more details you find. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fascinating when you put it that way, because when you look at the assassination and you think of someone like Giancana, for example, (laughs) uh, he gets, you know, as soon as the 1977 hearings come up, they get rid of him and they shoot him in the mouth, you know, uh, in uh, mafia style, style, meaning, you know, he talked too much, basically. And what's interesting is um, Giancana is the one who's associated with Exner, and that's where things are yep. going back and forth. Yep. What's, what's interesting is that Kennedy um, could also have been getting the intel of the CIA trying to hire Giancana to kill Castro, and instead of being yep. the guy behind the plot, as they try to do, you're like, oh, the Kennedys were trying to kill Castro. There's zero evidence for that. In fact, the Central Intelligence Agency were trying to do it on their own, mm-hmm. And there's a number of people who've come forward and said, I talked to Kennedy about this, and he was furious when he found out about this. He might be going through the mafia to get intel on the intelligence um, assets yes, trying absolutely, to kill. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He's, he, you know, Kennedy's not stupid. He knows at the end of the Bay of Pigs fiasco that he's confronted with a rogue agency trying to conduct its own foreign policy. Right. He knows this as an absolute certainty. So everything that you say makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you, how do you, if, if you're John Kennedy and you're confronted with this huge, enormous, uh, deep state that's completely rogue, mm-hmm. how might you go about trying to, to counterweight it? Because let's, let's face facts. He may have had some idea through his contact uh, contact with Forrestal and some other people, mm-hmm. he may have had some idea of the extent of this deep state. But once he gets into office, I think he's exactly like Trump in this respect. Once he gets into office, he finds out that this thing is much bigger and much more powerful and much more corrupt and much more independent of, of the actual government than anybody than anybody really has estimated. Yes. Now, to his credit, he does something that Trump did not do, and he puts his own brother in charge of the Justice Department. <laughs> That's incredible. That's yeah. what saves his bacon, I think, long before the assassination. Right. Yeah. Had he not done that and then pulled the Bay of Pigs thing, that assassination, in my opinion, probably would have come off much earlier. 
Interesting. Bobby in there is the guy that keeps the check on Hoover. And folks, the FBI is just as corrupt now as it was back then. So no you know, nothing, nothing new there. But, yeah. Um, Bobby in there is able to keep some sort of check on, on all these shenanigans. But how do you counterweight this massive deep state? Your brother's not enough to do it. Mm -hmm. What you need is something huge and something public and something that has its own counterweight. Well, the moon is huge and public. Mm. And going there with Soviet Russia, which has its own little version of the deep state, is a huge counterweight. Unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think in terms of the calculus, uh, we've probably underestimated what JFK may have been thinking. Yeah. Because yeah. he's making he's making an intelligence deal. Let's remember what he says to the CIA. Vet your UFO files. We need to turn the ones that are not national security related over to the Russians. Right. What he's doing is he's putting Nikita Khrushchev in a position, he's pinning him, where Nikita Khrushchev is going to have to reciprocate somehow. Ah, and right. once you get this intelligence game going, then you can go to Khrushchev and say, hey, I've got this problem, and it's called Alan Dulles. What can you guys tell me about him? Uh, and I imagine that the Komiatet goes for Darsvenoi Bjerzhopoznosti can tell you quite a bit about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not publicly known, <laughs> as, <laughs> as it were. So, yeah, I, I think. Oh, they've been tracking a, him from day one. Oh, you bet they have. You know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I get this impression that can it, there's more going on here than even, even the UFO files and so on. I think Kennedy's playing some sort of very delicate chess game to try to get into a position that he can counterweight this American deep state with a personal conduit to Soviet Russia and whatever information they would be willing to share with him that gives him leverage over the American problem that he's facing. Abs I, I, you know, these people play at a, at a different level than you and I, and, and, I think I think this wow. has to enter the calculus of his thinking in some form or fashion. Incredible. Yeah. He's looking for something to use as a counter. Yeah. Yes. yeah. The yeah. moon is a fantastic, it's, it's no fantastic. for this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because having set that in motion, you can't really ever pull back from it. And besides that, he, you know, again, Kennedy is, is a very shrewd politician in this respect because he's now euchred Lyndon Johnson into support of the whole thing. Right. You know, Lyndon Johnson can't go back on his own, on his own moon promises, you know, right. that he was making as majority leader in the Senate. Can't. Right. Can't. He's on record. Gotcha, yeah. Lyndon. <laughs> <laughs> Lion Lyndon. Yeah, Lion Lyndon. And by the way, in 64, you're out. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. you know. And probably going to jail. And probably go going to jail on top of it. <laughs> it's Bobby's Justice Department, Lyndon. Sorry, I can't do anything. <laughs> Can you imagine? Jeez. Uh, I mean, it would yeah. have been a totally different 60s. It's oh, completely. Just remarkable. You know, we we have been living with the reaper. You know, I've said it before. We have been living with the repercussions of that coup d'état ever since. And if you want to know why America's a mess, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. That's why. No question. No question. Joseph, just amazing insights and information. Now stay right there and we'll record part two for subscribers and go even deeper on the true nature of NASA, the space program, and UFO secrecy. Go to darkjournalist.com to become a member now. Joseph's new book, Giza Death Star Revisited, is available at adventuresunlimitedpress.com and gizadeathstar.com. Please join us on Fridays at 8 p.m. for the Dark Journalist X series. See you soon.